Hello, everybody. My name is Dave Jackson, and you're listening to Tales from the Backlog. This is a video games deep dive review podcast where each week I'm joined by a guest to bring a game out of the backlog, play it, and discuss. My guest today is a returning friend of the show, editor-in-chief of the Indie Informer, host of the Indie Council podcast, and the guardian spirit of indie games. Welcome back, Jill Grote. Ooh, that last one I wasn't prepared for. That's exciting. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Yeah. Good to uh, have you back on the show. In episode 75 of Tales from the Backlog, we talked about Dredge, uh, which did. is, yeah, a little horror adjacent game. We're back with another horror game, full on horror game today. It's so off brand for me. I don't know why I keep doing this to yeah. myself. I'm probably the guardian spirit because I am now a ghost from having played the game you've made me play. I made you play it. We'll talk about this in a little bit. But yeah, uh, today we're going to talk about Devotion, which is a first person horror game developed and published by Red Candle Games for PC in 2019. If this is your first time listening to the show, first of all, thanks for stopping by. And here is the spoiler policy. Devotion is a super story heavy game. And as always, we're going to save the story spoilers for the second portion of the episode. So if you don't want to be spoiled, you can listen for a while. Make sure to jump out when we warn you that spoilers are coming. You can also look down in the show notes for a timestamp for when the spoilers actually begin for Devotion. Wouldn't it be terrible if we did spoilers like a jump scare? Just like, ah! Oh, it would be uh, be on brand for Horror (laughs) Month. Just a, a random... Yeah, well, not you'll have no idea whether or not we're going to do that, listeners. So prepare yourself. Trying to keep you on edge over here. (laughs) Uh, So what is Devotion? We have our quick elevator pitches at the top of the show. Uh, I say Devotion is Taiwanese first person Silent Hill 2. That is my pitch. Jill, what would you say? Yours is a little more succinct than mine. Mine is, first of all, real scared. Second Uh of all, Uh, It's an exploration of family, societal, and cultural expectations in the form of horror. Absolutely. Uh, Horror games do a a good job of drilling down into a lot of those things in uh, entertaining ways. So uh, Devotion has all that stuff going on. I play, well, I played this on PC, not like we have much of a choice there. It took three hours to beat. Does that sound about right to you? Yeah, right about there. Uh, Devotion was uh, delisted from all uh, regular storefronts that we usually get our games from. So you can get the game direct from the Red Candle Games website, uh, which is how I assume uh, you got it too. I did indeed, yes. Yeah. So three hours, not a very long game. So back to that uh, idea that I made you play this game uh, here today. Um, <laughs> what is your history with Devotion and why was it the one that you decided you want to talk about on the show today? So it's one of those things. First of all, Red Candle Games just uh, released a game this year called Nine Souls, Mm -hmm. which is in every way unexpected for what Devotion is and what Red Candle Games has done before. They've been sort of a horror horror game creator. Nine Souls is a fast-paced, kind of Sekiro-like, animated, slightly anime-looking game. beautiful beautiful like it's 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 wild it shouldn't it's an action platformer type souls like and it and it shouldn't exist and it shouldn't be as good as as it is (laughs) and it's a hundred percent as good as it is like y'all should go check that out yeah um and of course i going back to my time at game informer speaking of things that are (laughs) scary um i started reaching out to Red Candle Games to talk to them about Nine Souls. Okay. And because it was so different and because they have a history uh, with devotion and all of that stuff had been happening, like Mm -hmm. they had just come back and and there was all that hubbub. Um, So I've been kind of professionally connected with this uh, studio. And I I wanted like uh, Marcus Stewart, lovely human being, also a big indies fan and he's also a horror fan unlike me Mm -hmm. so he was the one who was really pushing for like no you guys need to play devotion because as you kind of talked about uh on the opening devotion came out in 2019 and very quickly after that was delisted from everything Mm -hmm. and a lot of that has to do with a 
like an asset in the background on a wall somewhere. It wasn't even like part of the game. It was really just somewhere in the background. Yeah. That conflated the Chinese president with Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> yeah, which which he doesn't like. So not like that is a real thing that he is known to be against and does not allow. Yeah. And like goes on the attack whenever that's around like right. that. Yeah. And Red Candle Games is a Taiwanese developer. Um and there are geopolitical tensions depending on what view you take on who owns Taiwan. Yeah. So China got really upset about this. Like this was an actual like international political problem. So any storefront who wanted to do business in China, which has a lot of business to give, probably were not willing to take the side of a small indie developer yep. for a little horror game. So it got delisted and then it came back up a couple of years later. I want to say it was in like 2021 that Devotion became available again because the developer themselves set up a website that you could go through um, to actually d buy the game directly from them. Yeah. So yeah, all of this was happening and I was interested in their next game because it's definitely my jam. And I was sort of like, I really should play Devotion because I 100% am following the story. I am intrigued by what is happening in the real world concerning this game. I am super into the fact that they're switching so dramatically in their next game. So I did want to play it at some point, and this presented a good reason to do that because it's go it's been in my backlog forever. I'm always like, I'm going to play this. I really, really am going to play it. Today's yeah. the day. And then, <laughs> no, it's just a little too creepy. I'm going to go ahead and walk away. Um, so it was a good good chance to be able to play. Yeah, I I take pride now in giving people the opportunity to be like, hey, what's that thing that you need a little push to play? Let's mm -hmm. let's do that. So I'm glad I could give that opportunity to you. Uh, did you play Detention, the one before not. this? No. Okay. So I played Detention earlier this year and uh, really, really liked it. And that was another one that I had bought for a while ago because it was cheap and I heard it was good. And then I was like, this looks scary. I probably you know, may never play this, but eventually got around to it. And I really, really liked it. Uh, so that was part of why I wanted to play Devotion. The other part was um, I listened to the episode of Watch Out for Fireballs, where they did a detailed play-by-play -play plot discussion of Devotion. So I spoiled the entire story because I thought I'd never play it because it looked right. too scary. And the way they described it, it's the exact same thing that happened with Soma for me, where the way they went through the plot, the way they talked about it made it sound so interesting that it was like, I got to play this and like see this stuff for myself. Mm -hmm. So that's why it went on my list. I think it was on my backlog resolutions list for 2024 of stuff that I, you know, I need that extra push. So uh, here we are. And uh, I did do a quick shout out. I did do a Patreon only episode about detention. Uh, so if patrons want to go listen to that, any patron can uh, just me solo talking about detention. I really like that game. And uh, despite misnaming uh, the protagonist of detention, because I was also playing Xenogears at the time. <laughs> and uh, Xenogears main character's name is Faye and the main character's name in detention is Wei. So uh, maybe listen to the episode and just imagine Faye from Xenogears in the school in detention. A little fun thought exercise. Would it be less scary or more scary? Uh, I think that Faye could probably do a little bit more to defend himself than, uh, <laughs> than the main character in detention from the ghosts and stuff like that. But No, but like psychologically, if someone is used to being able to defend themselves and you mm. take away that ability, could be more scary. It could be scarier because Faye from Xenogears has a lot going on in his head, like a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, so yeah, uh, that is what made me want to play Devotion. Basically, basically everyone who played it says that this is really, really good. And it's just unfortunate the whole situation where every storefront said we're not touching this mm -hmm. because of the controversy that came up. And uh, after playing this, I got to agree that 
This is really, really good. In my opinion, it's one of the best horror experience I think I've ever had. And the way that they constrained the whole game to this very small location, you know, going through time, seeing the history of this family and these characters and stuff, uh, it's all just masterfully made, I think. And it's, it's real scary. The story is really tragic, as a lot of psychological horror stories are. Uh, and I really liked it. And I also really like games that are set in um, other countries, like not the US, not Japan. I like to learn about other countries through the games that those creators make. And this is a great one for that. And so is Detention. Um, I mean, I learned more about Taiwan and their history playing Detention than I ever knew before. <laughs> uh, so it's uh, it's good for that. Uh, Jill, what would you say at the top for some uh, quick opening thoughts about Devotion? I like that both of us have used the phrase real scary, and I like it because it's it describes a sort of fear that is not propagated by a monster or some sort of spooky something happening. Like The real scary thing about this is that everyone is very human and very yeah. understandable, and you completely understand what's happening and you're still going through it anyway you're still walking down like i'm freaking i'm not spoiling anything i guess right now but like things happen and i'm like why am i doing this why am i doing this <laughs> to myself but i'm still doing it and you understand what is pushing the main character and all the other characters involved um and while arguably there there is a bad person like there's not really a like an evil person but like there is you know there are some people who you like more than others yeah and again you talked about masterfully done just it, you, to pitch this game to someone it's like okay you are in a situation where you are in the same apartment over and over and over again and you are literally retreading ground you've been in um, it, that shouldn't be scary. And somehow every time it is creative and different and even in the subtle differences, you, you notice those so much more because you come, become so familiar with your surroundings. Yeah. You're like, wait a minute, that, that wasn't there. Why is that? What's happening here? Uh, which makes it even more unsettling because you get to know the apartment as if it were sort of your own space. Yep. And yeah, so there is a great amount of this is a real scary game because there's no, I mean, I mean, you can argue, we can argue about what the ending means and all of that, but there is no, everything is happening is, is human. Everything yeah. that's happening is human. Absolutely. Uh, there, it, it is like, you know, psychological horror and there is uh, fantasy and wild explorations of like, you know, non-real places and things like that but at the game's core it's superhuman you're mm -hmm. completely right about that uh let's put a pin in story discussion let's take a little music break and we'll come back and we'll kind of reset set up what the story is about and talk about how this game delivers it <laughs> At the beginning of the spoiler section, just a quick, uh, tip uh if you're sensitive to content warnings please check does the dog die.com for this game uh, i don't want to spoil what uh the content warning is because literally spoil what happens in the game right now but that website's really good it's not just about animals dying it will have all kinds of potentially triggering content listed on there and this is definitely a game that you know if you think you might be sensitive to things like that definitely go check it out. So I'll reiterate this with details at the beginning of the spoiler section, but for now, we'll leave it at that. Now, 
Devotion is set in the 1980s in Taipei, which is the capital of Taiwan. You play as a screenwriter named Feng Yu Du, and in the game it will be listed out as Du Feng Yu, as um, Chinese and Taiwanese names are written. Feng Yu lives in a small apartment with his wife, uh, Gong Li Fang, and young daughter, Mei Xin. And at the beginning, you're sitting on the couch. Li Fang is making dinner, talking about the progress that Mei Xin has made after a year of working with her mentor. Dinner is ready, so she calls Mei Xin, but Mei Xin doesn't come. They keep calling Mei Xin, and as the calls keep going and going, the scene warps, and you switch from the normal, you know, early evening apartment to this dark horror version of the apartment. You're alone, and you're off to explore. And what you are exploring is this family's history throughout uh, the 1980s. So you go through four time periods, 1980, 1985, 1986, and 1987. And this, uh, you get like the slightest hint of a mystery, right? At the beginning, like, why is Mason not coming to dinner? And then it shifts and suddenly you're all alone left to explore this stuff. Did this hook you at the beginning of the game? Yeah. I mean, it's such a good way to... Uh, I mean, I'm going to actually go off the rails here and go okay. farther back. But just to answer your question, it is a great way to start the action of a game to present someone with like a very normal... Like everyone goes into this game knowing it's a horror game. There's no one yeah. in here that thinks like, oh, this is going to be a happy game. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> Look at the key art. You know this is a horror game. Yeah. So you know that something is is going to be wrong and you want to figure that out. But you are also, as a human being, like hesitant because it's, you know, you're already scared. Um, but jumping to even before you get anywhere near the game, it is so funny to me how inadvertently taking this game off of every platform has made it scary from even getting it because mm. it it reaches into touchstones like maybe the ring or or things of that nature where you, this is not something you can just get this is not something that you just go to the store and pick up you have to know where to get it it's only in one special place you have to do uh -huh. weird things to pick it up so it's kind of like already setting the tone which works really well for this game i'm like it's not an intentional design element but like maybe more people should do this because it uh -huh. put me in a very particular mood it's not where you know it's not in steam where all my other games are listed like it's in a special folder i have to go to and then when the game opens because i had just been playing nine souls um the opening is exactly the same oh okay yeah um uh, so it's got the like red candle games it's got a little like Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Warning down at the bottom. Mm -hmm. That's like, there is cruelty in this game. And and I'm like, oh, that's that's interesting that they've kept that. So I'm already feeling like when you watch, I watched for a long time Game of Thrones on Netflix. So when Netflix popped up, like the doo -doo, like opening, uh -huh. I always expected the next sound to be, Bum, bum, ba -da -dum, bum. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I psychologically saw that and expected to see an action Souls-like game. And suddenly I was in this really creepy psychological horror game. Like mm -hmm. that put me right into the mood. I'm like this, everything about this is unsettling. It is weird. It is not the way things are supposed to be. And now I'm just sitting here like listening to someone talk to me while they are making dinner and it's uh -huh. not okay. Like <laughs> <laughs> it does have a little bit of that, like forbidden game uh, type of feeling. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I bought this a long time ago. I had to put a shortcut on my desktop so I wouldn't forget that I own it. Cause you know, like you said, it's not my steam library, stuff like that. And then that apartment is designed in such a way that like, it's a normal apartment but it looks kind of creepy. Mm -hmm. um, it's a first person game, but when it begins, you don't see Li Fang at all. You just hear her off in the other room. And the the design of the apartment is one of my favorite things about this game. Like the way that it starts out normal and then, you know, 
transitions into this like dark horror version of the apartment. But then you go through like, I don't know, 10 to 20 other different versions of the apartment throughout the game and like the subtle ways that it changes. Yeah. And it's so good how well they have like hooked it into your brain where you can just look at something and be like, oh, this is this year version of it. Even Mm -hmm. though you are for the most part walking through the door and it tells you, even if you didn't have that, you'd be like, oh, okay. So now we have pictures of little girl being this old. So we have to be at this time period. Yeah. And we know kind of where the relationship between everyone is. And oh, it's so good. Yeah. I love the dolls also, as you know, they they have scenes that they want to show you where there have to be people. But I think that this is a a practical choice, you know, not modeling realistic looking characters because like the the graphical fidelity of the game is quite high. It's Mm -hmm. not it's not it's stylized, but it's not like super stylized. So instead of modeling human characters, they use these life size wooden dolls in place of mannequins, y'all. Um, they're they're scary. Yeah. There is something psychological like in human development for some reason that we like uncanny valley situation where you have a humanoid shape that's not human and it breaks you out and this yep. does this so well both as like a it wouldn't be as scary if you just had all of the characters sitting in there and acting out roles. It's so yep. much scarier to have them be a bunch of mannequins who turn and look at you during different situations. Like, Yeah. Like you might turn your back and they might shift a little bit, or there might be more of them than there used to be or something like that. They're not And you used- say might because like you are sort of arguing with yourself. So like, did it move? Yeah. Am sometimes. I making that up? Yeah. And then sometimes it's very clear that they moved. Yeah. But it's not like, um, like they're not used for like big jump scare moments or like they don't come to life and, you know, right. attack you or anything like that. They're just little shifts in the fact that the mannequins are creepy by nature is used to, to great advantage here. So... You are moving between these time periods and the game will put you in, uh, you, you do like an opening section and then the the meat of this game is the section where you're traveling like in a kind of non-linear way between these time periods. Like it sets up, this door goes to the 1980 apartment, this door goes to 1985, yada, yada, yada. Um, you go through these sections, you will learn about the history of the family and the characters. Uh, so... Feng Yu is a a screenwriter. Li Fang is a former like pop idol and actress who retired to focus on family life. And then they have uh, the young daughter, uh, Mei Xin. So um, I really like how, you know, it, it's almost like exploring at your own pace. It's almost like uh, you're not like following specific leads based on what you're most interested in. But you are piecing this together in a nonlinear fashion. And I found it like really interesting to learn about these people. Yeah, it is. It's so well done. Again, I was saying like, you know what what apartment you're standing in at all times. Of course, like any good game, you start out without all the scary stuff, essentially. Like you are just learning. Okay. Like you get little hints. You get tiny little pricks of like okay, things might not be going well. And you're getting like the tracks laid for you. Um, We are learning about obviously the being a screenwriter, being an actress, those are very glamorous things that seem really cool. Uh, But you can start to very quickly see that they are also very pressurizing. Uh and, um, And then in the jobs you start to see some gender roles that are being poked at here because culturally speaking uh, you like obviously you are playing as the husband and the husband should be making the money and taking care of the family and has control over what's going on Uh, but this person is obviously not being very successful in like I, i i don't think that he sold a script for like years and years and yeah. they've got money issues that start coming down. And then you have a super a- attractive and popular and famous pop idol as your wife. Um, she obviously expects 
certain standards, but you're not allowing her to go back to work and be fulfilled in that way because yeah. of the traditional cultural expectation of the wife stays home and takes care of the kid. And then you have a kid who is also on top of all of this sick or is she? <laughs> like, right. Um, so you've got a lot of things kind of simmering under the surface, even in this early beginning part where everything seems kind of normal. And then you're just going around the apartment and like seeing little pictures on things or like reading little clips of things on the wall or watching little TV snippets. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems pretty normal to begin with. Um, and it's not normal. That's not normal. It is. Uh, it is not normal for sure. But um, I'm glad you brought up the the theme of exploring uh, the gender roles and cultural expectations uh, in the game because that's a a big thing that plays into why characters do some of the things that they do. Uh, another one that's brought up is uh, religious fanaticism and uh, what what could drive somebody to like place their beliefs and place stock in those kinds of things, uh, cults and things like that. Like you mentioned at the beginning, like the, the things that are really driving the characters here aren't fantasy land, uh, things like a zombie outbreak or something like that. It's very real, uh, dynamics and pressures, whether it's like cultural pressures or just the literal pressure of like, Hey, we're running out of money. Like, you know, we're having issues. Uh, or whether it's a a sickness or something like that, it's all rooted in superhuman stuff. Which um, you know, got to give Red Candle a lot of credit here because I thought the writing, uh, especially because this is you know translated, we're not reading the original text uh, in the original language. Got to give credit to the writing, the localization for really driving these things across. Um, I I really legitimately looked forward to every note that I found or every description of every item that I picked up because I was yeah. really, really interested in what it was going to say. And how it was going to piece together. And then uh, there were a lot of times when you go on later in the game where you come across something and you immediately recall like, oh, yeah, that's going to be, that's why that was important. I do want to, like you talked about the religious fanaticism and I just want to shout out that they did my boy slash girl, Guan Yin, real dirty here. Oh, because yeah. <laughs> Guan Yin is a body, bodhisattva of like compassion. Um, mm. And this, this religious figure who comes in sort of later in the game um, as a way setting themselves up to be the path to health for this little girl um, is really twisting a figure who should be in all other respects, absolute just compassion and understanding and a good, a feel good type of religious figure. Um, and for some reason that bothers me just that much more, you know? Okay. I, so I did a little bit of, you know, very light research about that, that figure. And in this cultural perspective, it's the one that they're modeling it after is the household guardian spirit of the the toilet which sounds uh like it sounds like juvenile or something but it, it comes from a you know a long time ago when you know you needed guardian spirits for every part of the place or something like that um but i think that the role here or the like the the twisting of it from this you know seemingly benevolent spirit whether whether it's one cultural interpretation or another it's the people who are twisting it for their own benefit rather than like, this is not a story about an evil God or yeah. something like that. It's the people who are twisting it for their own gain, which I think, you know, again, we're back to that very human level here. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, and it's so scary. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It does yeah. lead to an ending, which has elements of the supernatural, which I find very interesting uh, and I don't know if we want to get into it right now or we want to talk about kind of the middle section uh, before we go forward. But I do yeah. just want to just quickly see that I think the ending of this game has gotten a bit more flack than it should have. Oh, wow. I have not heard 
like backlash against this ending. I thought the ending of this game was incredible. I thought like, it was really cool. But there yeah. are people who are like, oh, it was doing really cool things, being realistic and grounded, and then it wasn't. I'm like, no, huh. we're going to talk about that. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that for sure. Um, one other thing about this. So like you're going through the different time periods in these different apartments. And part of this also is uh, like very light adventure game gameplay where you're like picking up a key item that will help unlock something. And maybe like you pick up something in 1985 that helps you unlock something in 1980 that gives you a lore note or like another key item, um, all with the purpose of you have to put together this, uh, like this metal plate that unlocks the last apartment. Um, so this is not a game with like super heavy gameplay, but what did you think about this, you know, light adventure gamey stuff? Uh, I thought it was exactly the sort of gameplay you need for this kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And and again, because I had just been playing Nine Souls, which is a very fast and fast paced (laughs) and like fluid movements and everything. um, It was so interesting to see this team take on this, or I guess probably reverse, but for me, it was Nine Souls and then Devotion. To see this team's take on slow movements and... Like uh, slow is not really the right word, but like lingering and you're not really, you don't really have a run. You like know, you, you kind walk of super do. slow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there are times when you would really like to run, Uh huh. but it is scarier for the fact that you are, it, it, give, it takes away control to some degree. And that is always a scarier thing. And I do enjoy this. And I think there is also a very well done element of you always sort of know where to go and what you're doing Mm -hmm. it is very subtle like use of light and use of mannequins freaking pointing you out of the way or like (laughs) knowing sounds like sound design in this game is really really good yep um kind of all pushing you to not get lost to not i was never in a position where i was frustrated i'm like okay i don't know what i'm supposed to do with this origami flower or whatever you know it's like oh okay i got it now um so they did a really good job of pointing both like literally sometimes pointing but also just design wise pointing you in the right direction yeah i i think so like the question in my head when i play something like this is because the the gameplay elements are really light. So like the question is, would this be better if it was a walking sim and you just didn't do this stuff? And I I don't think that this game would be, uh, be, you know, two reasons. Number one, it gives you a reason to go in this nonlinear way through the story and it. It makes putting the pieces of the story together a, a more fun exercise than a walking sim would be like a much more linear straight shot through the story, uh, unless they really changed up how it worked. The other part is the items that you pick up in contrast with a lot of adventure game, you know, puzzle items is they're all important for the story. And so like you pick up a dress, it's an adventure game puzzle item, but it's also important for the story because that dress is important for the history between husband and wife in the story here. So that kind of stuff kind of makes this worth doing, even though it is very, very simple. The only gameplay thing that I did not like is there's a chase sequence yeah. late in the mm-hmm. game that I thought was just kind of misplaced and didn't seem like it fit. I would have been okay. I would have been more okay with the chase scene, but I think there was one turn or one door where it just wasn't like right in front of me. Mm-hmm. So I can't like the problem with having a monster chase you who can catch you in a horror game is that it's always scarier having the monster chase you than catch you. And once the monster has caught you once, twice, three times, yeah. you're sort of like, okay, there, nothing bad happens. Like, I know this now. So it's just a matter of getting through. So if you can design a chase scene that keeps that tension and but never really allows for the thing to catch you, like, that would have been better. Uh, as far as gameplay change-ups go, though, mm-hmm. we have a couple of sections where you go from this kind of first-person adventure oh, yeah. slow action to 
a whole different things like 2D platform, side scrolly, beautiful, beautiful. Like at one point you are in a storybook. Yep. And it's so pretty. <laughs> and mm-hmm. it's like, okay, I I really enjoy this because I've been kind of bogged down in the mundane-ish. Like it's creepy and it's mundane-ish. Like the the apartment and and what you're doing and and to suddenly be in this fantastic world of beautiful bright colors and fun creatures was both refreshing and at the same time made going back into the real world just kind of that much scarier Mm -hmm. so i really appreciated those moments of of fantasy Yeah. And it's, you know, it's not a super long game. So when you, when you talk about breaking up gameplay, usually we appreciate this or I appreciate this in longer games where I would be like, I've been doing the same thing for five hours. It'd be nice to have something different to do right now. But this game's so short that like you have a few quick things that, that break up that, that rhythm of exploring the apartments and they're super visually impressive. The one you mentioned, it's, use in the story is really really good we'll Mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit later but that stuff is good Uh, let's talk about this game's the way that it does horror because I got some other stuff I want to talk about. Okay, um, let's hit it. We talked about the dolls. There are some jump scares, but it's not a jump scare game. Um, right. I think it only got me about twice. Yeah, there's a couple. Yeah, with that with that monster, um, and the monster is interesting from a story perspective too. Can't wait to talk about that. Um, this is one of those games where we say like, this is really cool. Come back in a half we'll hour. We'll it. talk about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think there's a lot of like times when like something subtle will happen that will give you a little bit of a, a start, but it's not like things jumping out at the screen at you. I think this game's super smart about how it makes horror and like makes you uneasy with other stuff like the FMVs that you watch. FMVs in a non FMV game are always a little bit creepy. So, and then you add in like, a little girl singing and i don't know why that is so much creepier oh but we've seen we've all seen a horror movie with a weird <laughs> little kid right so <laughs> we know um there is uh when you're like watching the tv and you see uh there's a singing competition that you watch or the the commercials were oddly creepy to me too they're just from all i can tell they're just regular commercials from you know they're not in english of course Maybe that adds a little bit to it, but, and they're older, like vintage commercials like from yeah. the 80s. Um, like if you look at 80s, 90s commercials, like commercials I grew up watching and we're like, that's totally normal. If you go back and watch them now, you're sort of like, oh, that feels weird. Some of them are weird, especially yeah. the, the the gaming commercials from the 90s. They they did some weird shit in they gaming commercials back then. Very strange thing. So like it's, <laughs> it's an element of taking something from its place in time where it had cultural touchstones that made it acceptable and kind of like a fish breathing water. Like mm-hmm. you take it out of the water and suddenly – you are hyper aware of how weird and upsetting in some cases these Mm -hmm. things can be. And that's exactly the feeling that you get with these commercials. Yeah. Also with the sound, like with the music and the sound design, you mentioned the sound design before, but like this game is, is just full of, you know, creepy knocking in the Mm -hmm. background or the Mm -hmm. wind blowing or the rain or just generally unsettling stuff happening all the time. Great for that. Yeah. You can hear the TV and it's like, I haven't done that since I was a kid, you know, Uh like, because it's, that's just anyone who's younger than us. And I don't want to think about that because I don't (laughs) want to think about how old I am, Uh but like, won't understand what hearing your TV sounds like. 
But I can remember when you're booting up like an old game or like an old TV show or something like the humming, the like yeah. buzzy sound that a TV makes. And then this game recreates that in such a good way. And I'm like, I hate that you're doing this to me, but I also really love it. So go ahead. But yeah, it goes into that like atmosphere. Um, this game's also, this game also has a lot of very atmospheric background music, like a silent Hill or something like that, whether it's, you know, just, you know, some tones or something, or there are a couple parts that have the, that kind of trademark Silent Hill, like industrial sounds, you know, when it's, it's time to get your blood pumping a little bit, they'll mm-hmm. do that. There's vocals in some of the songs and the vocals are distorted. A lot of weird stuff. There's one year, I can't remember, I think it was 86, mm-hmm. where there's a storm in yeah. the background and it's constantly like threatening to open the windows and break through things and it's just that much it's you know it's not scary it is just a storm that happens Mm -hmm. but it just starts the tension a little bit higher than you know a normal sunny day yep uh also in the sound is um for lack of a better word and i don't know the instruments but like traditional east asian instruments that make up the the music anytime there's like a a melodic song or something like that they're using these you you know local instruments in there and there is one like actual song with like a person singing that is used in different forms throughout the game sung by different people uh, and the way that that plays into the story uh, but i i like the touch of using the instruments you know local to taiwan uh, in those you know traditional sounds for everything that's not industrial banging or a storm out in the background. Right. It's almost every element of this game is woven into another element Uh and another theme. And it all sort of backs each other and uh, makes for a really solid experience even before you get the characters and the plot going. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, this is a game about cultural familiar, familial expectations so you have a lot of that woven into the background already so Mm -hmm. you kind of if you know it's you're not like in it's not in your face but you are as a human being just kind of trained to pick up on those kinds of cues Mm -hmm. and they have done this so so well yeah so so like there's a lot of games i think where you play and they're like this game is set in washington state and you play it and you're like I don't know, could be Washington, might not be, who knows. Uh, this game definitely puts you in that that Taiwanese setting. I feel like even if you've never been to Taiwan, you definitely get the sense that it's coming from all places. The The way the apartment is designed, the stuff hanging on the walls, like the, the big family portrait. Um, there's a lot of stuff we'll talk about in the spoiler section where I'm going to make comparisons between the Taiwanese cultural thing that's in the game and the Korean cultural thing that's in, you know, my personal life experience. Um, That big family portrait is one of those things. Uh, The way the calendars look, you know, a lot of the stuff around the apartment, those music, the sounds, all of that stuff puts you in that place really, really well. So like you could give someone this game and they would not mistake it for another place. Mm Mm-hmm really impressive. Also, just a quick shout out. I don't think we said this yet, but I think the fact that I did say part of this, but that's, you know, (laughs) brains. Uh, (laughs) The fact that this takes place in one location that's reused over and over again, so they can like use the bones of this apartment. And then there are so many different variations of it. And the creativity is wild for how these different places look like the use of light, the use of, you know, maybe some fantasy elements, uh, the use of those dolls, the use of you open up this room and it's uh, it's full of stacks of paper. And it's, you know, all the ways that that um, kind of they, they're telling you a story with the way the apartment looks every single time. And you kind of have to like sit and be like, why is this room full of stacks of papers? What does this mean? All of that stuff is really, really good and super creative. Yeah, they have a very, very small space to work with, and they use every single inch of it Yeah, at every part of the game. Absolutely. 
Anything else uh, that we want to shout out about the game in the non-spoiler part before we uh, before we dive into the story? I don't think so. I think we should get to spoiling. Yeah. Well, before we get to spoiling, we got to uh, wrap up the non-spoiler part here okay. by uh, <laughs> talk giving our our recommendations. So. I think it's pretty obvious that both of us enjoy what this game is doing. So, uh, Jill, what kind of person do you think Devotion appeals to? uh, I was going to be self-deprecating, but um, (laughs) I think this is a good game. I mean, I know people who are the sorts of people that play Dredge, looping back to our earlier episode, Mm -hmm. who only go out in the daytime. And don't even want to see the nighttime stuff. So like maybe that if you're that level, maybe this isn't the game for you. But if you're at all interested, it is not a scary game in it will keep you up at night and, yeah, you know, monsters trying to get you sort of thing. It is very much um, scary because it is so familiar and understandable and relatable. Um, and it follows people to a conclusion which actually happens in in real life perhaps not to as spectacular if that's the word uh, Mm -hmm. an extent but if you are the sort of person who is interested in the study of human character if you're someone who is interested in a game that you can pick up and play for three hours and then think about it for as long as the gameplay or more like this is this is probably a game you should check out. Yeah, I I think that number one, if you like horror games, this is an unqualified like you got to play this. I think it's one of the best horror games I've ever played uh, for all those reasons we talked about before. And the story will really stick with you. Um, And I think that it is, as you've said, and we, we chatted about earlier, it is that that human core behind the story, which is it's why I'm finding myself drawn to psychological horror games more than other kinds, because I love, you know, this game is going to be a really fucked up character study. And I really love that. And this game is that, and it's just really good at that. And you make a good point too, that like, that's where the horror comes from is these explorations of motivations and acts and then like the of course the sound design and the the visual creativity and stuff like that but it's not you know it's not like i watched the conjuring and it you know scared me so bad i couldn't sleep like it's not that kind of horror it's more of a lingering thing when you think about what happened in the story in this game where i think that's what will stick with me is you know they had this this idea for how this story is going to play out and how they're going to explore the characters and why they did the things that they did. And that stuff will stick with me. So I think it's excellent. Yeah. It's also surprisingly relevant if you are perhaps uh, connected to someone who might be irrationally attracted to leaders that are charismatic and promising things. Uh huh. So uh, you might find it a little too close for comfort just because of things that are happening in present day. But like, that's another good sign of art. A good piece of art should be relevant and be able to point to things in times far past when they were made. And I think that's why this is going to be such a good game for as long as people are playing games. What this game is talking about is timeless for sure. And you can apply it to lots of different situations. So... (laughs) Uh, no more spoiler, no more story until the spoiler section. Let's finish out the, uh, with a little bit of housekeeping. And as always, the guest goes first. So Jill, please tell people again about the Indie Informer, the Indie Council, and where people can find you. Uh, yeah, you can go check out the Indie Informer. Just Google it, I guess. <laughs> uh-huh. Indieinformer.com <laughs> is a website dedicated to purely to indie games and indie gaming and what's going on right now. What's going on is Gamescom and there's a lot of Gamescom stuff uh, and a lot of indies pop up and come out of that. And there are a lot of really cool things. I think during opening night live, my highlight was Hurdly, uh, which looks really cool. And it, I, it's going to be some sort of 
fun narrative game, but it's just been revealed, so we don't know that much about it. Uh, likewise, the Indie Council is a collaborative podcast, so mm -hmm. it doesn't really belong to the Indie Informer. It is a equal partnership collaboration between the Indie Informer of 61 Indie, uh, Jenny Windham, who runs uh, Geeks and Grounds, and then Janet Garcia, who is Penned Pixels, and mm -hmm. some people may know her from Min Max and kind of funny before that. And we all come together to talk about everything that's happened in the week for indie games, all the great games we've been playing. And it's very dangerous <laughs> to listen to it because uh, it, it's dangerous to be on it because we're all just like enthusiastic and happy and talking about uh, the things that we are enjoying. But that means that you put several more things on your list of, oh, I've got to play that by oh, the yeah. end of the show. And so you end up with all of these things that you can't possibly have enough time to play, mm -hmm. but you should go watch it. Yeah, it's a good time. Um, I'm a fan and uh, I'm a fan of the Indie Informers coverage. I try to shout it out in my Discord server whenever there's a, you know, interesting review up there for something I'm interested in playing. Also on the Indie Council, Jenny Windham, former guest on the podcast, we did the Animal Well episode together. Oh man, uh, she's She's fun. great. Janet's great. Mike is great. So good times. Um, I'll put links to everything down in the show notes so everybody can uh, check out everything that you're doing, and it's highly recommended. I thought you were going to go like, Jenny's great, Jan's great, Mike's okay. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't know Mike well enough uh, to do to that tease yet. him like that. I <laughs> <Yeah>. do. <laughs> okay, well, I'll let you do it then. We love you. Shout Mike. out to Mike. Yeah. Um, <laughs> For this podcast, you can support the same ways as always. Ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Podcast Addict are super helpful. Uh, likes and comments on YouTube so people find the episode, which is what we want. That's what my dog wants, too. He wants people to find the episode. So excited about it. Yeah, you can join the Discord server. And the dog's quieted down. He's not so excited about Discord. But mm -hmm. Discord's a great place. Uh, my server is a lively and welcoming community talking about games. Hopefully people in there talking about devotion this week. You can listen to my other podcast called A Top 3 Podcast, where we do top three lists and draft topics and things like that. And last but not least... If you want to support monetarily, patreon.com slash real Dave Jackson is the place. You can vote for games I do on the show. There are bonus episodes like the one about detention, Red Candle's game before devotion. Uh, forgive the slip up with the protagonist's name, but I think that's a good uh, solo chat about that game. It was all intentional. It was just to like get you farther into the horror element exactly. to get your brain a little twisted. Exactly. I, I'll pretend it was a mistake, but Jill knows the truth of the episode. Uh -huh. So uh, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, it will be full spoiler time for Devotion. Right. While we wait for people to file out, while spoilers are upcoming, I want to give the customary thank yous to the patrons who help support the show. Big shout out to Chris Nelson, the Top 3 Podcast crew, Chris Copleen, Eric Guess, Rick Firestone, Nick Fakori, Jill, Jeff, formerly Jerf, Kieran, Soccer, Cupcake, Kyle, Christian S., Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon, J.D., Doug Leaf, Jason Emery, Brian Skersha, Randall, Jake Martin, Jenny E., and many more. Big thank you to all of you who helped support the show. It means a lot to me. And let's get back to Devotion. Okay, we're back, and it's full spoiler time for Devotion. And a couple things before we dive into it. Number one, this is not going to be a linear walk through the story, so you can't listen and assume that what happens at the end will be held to the end of the episode. Yeah. So if you haven't played, please go play it. It's three hours long. Go play it. Support the developers. Uh, it's a good time. Even if we went linear, the game is not linear. So That's true, yeah. It's a, and I was going to say, it's a good time in air quotes. Uh, it's a good game. <laughs> 
Um, the other thing is the content warnings, which I said I would give more details on. Uh, this game includes lots of stuff that people might uh, not want to see in a game, including self amputation. There is yep. eye stuff. Yeah. Uh, someone he gouges his eye out with a spoon. So that's uh, not great. And this first person, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and then child abuse, domestic abuse, uh, gaslighting, and of course, the death of Mei Shin at the end of the game. So, or the implied death of Mei Shin. So you don't see it, which is good, but. Um, you mean we don't all just walk off in, in, to the happy sunset? We do walk off into a happy sunset. In a <laughs> there way. we go. That's yes. all we need to know. <laughs> yeah. So a happy ending for devotion. Yeah. Um, I wanted to start the spoiler section by talking about Feng Yu, the main character, because this is a game where you, uh, it plays with your expectation that you're the protagonist and you are in the right. Uh, you have this inherent want, at least I do, to like your protagonist and to want them to be correct and all of those things. And you're not. You are the bad guy in this game. You There's are the cause. Definite- yeah. Creeping feeling of like, am I the baddie? Oh yeah. Uh Feng Yu is is basically uh selfish, uh obsessive, um egotistical. Will not, yeah. Will not um, take help, uh controlling, all of those things. And the way that this all plays out into the death of his daughter is uh very, very interesting the way that this the way this goes. So um, I don't know if I actually mentioned the you mentioned it that he's a screenwriter, but he's not successful. He has had a lot of scripts rejected recently, and the one that did make it to screen got terrible reviews. So he uh, is not successful, and I think this is like the first thing in his journey towards what he does is this puts a um, like a self conscious feeling into him where he's like i'm failing at my job but my culture dictates that i need to be the one providing for the family but his screen right his screen and you you read one of the screenplays uh throughout where you pick up little bits and pieces of it throughout the game and it's awful like it would be the worst movie you've ever seen and it's all it's very telling as to who he is and what he thinks yeah uh things should be because it's all very like the woman says exactly what I want her to say to the yeah. man and the man is greatest and everyone worships him. Yep. And also very telling in the way that he takes notes and what the notes are saying and how he thinks that they're absolutely ridiculous mm-hmm. um, in that it's sort of like people don't want this kind of story anymore. And he's being told this outright by uh I don't remember exactly if it was someone who had worked with him or a close friend. I think maybe Mm -hmm. a bit of both was like giving him a like a real heart to heart on like you need to change and adapt for new audiences and what's going on in in the world. And he's steadfastly refusing and holding on to this idea of this is what's made me, um, we assume, successful in the past. Yeah. And – it is not working anymore and he doesn't know how to like his inability to adapt and change and his uh psychological rigor is is the core problem mm-hmm. in almost all of this if he were capable of taking any like bending at all yep. he would not break <laughs> later in the game the way he does yeah and instead he you know, forces his will on everybody around him. He projects his, you know, dreams onto his kid. Um, There's a part in one of the scripts where like, it says something like, you know, the father asks the daughter what she wants for a gift. And she says, I don't want anything. I want my parents to be happy. And it's like, come on, man. Like, (laughs) uh, but it's also, it's also, again, developers very smart red candle games have done a great job it is not only a bad thing for him as a human being Mm -hmm. but it is a very good note on societally should we be allowing this sort of person to control other people's lives and why is this person in a place to control 
like his mm-hmm. wife and his child. And if the wife had equal footing, if she culturally and like the if the people around her even, because the people around her are also in this culture. So they are telling her to, you know, can't you just kind of patch things up and like you should just yeah. say yes and and be okay with him and like cater to his whims and stuff. If she were able to be a full partner in this marriage, would they be having as bad a time? Because she was, again, very successful and she gave it up to have the family. And the fact that she had to give things up is perhaps we're poking a little bit at like, why would she have to give all of this up to be, Mm -hmm. you know, to have the perfect home life? And why does she not, why does he not have to give up his dreams and like there is a lot going on under the surface that they are not actually like saying it's just a lot of through the story and what is happening that you're kind of like yeah this wouldn't be happening except there's a perfect storm set up through all of these through lines and whether or not that's a good thing it's a really good social commentary yeah there's a lot of ways that like they present you with situations that show you, you know, this expression of of gender expectations and the roles that husband and wife should play. And they just show it to you in the way that people react to it and conversations that they have as real people and not telling you how you should feel about it. You just see it and you're like, okay, that's it's interesting that this is the way it works. And there's a couple of examples of that. Uh, you met the one you mentioned is when uh, Li Fang talks to her mom on the phone, mm-hmm. and her mom gives her the, some version of like we we see this in other areas too, like some version of like I went through this, you can go through this too, right? Um, she she, I, she tells her like, don't make this public; it will look bad for you. People will gossip if you you know if you make a, a scene. Um, she says, keep bedroom troubles in the bedroom when that's, I don't, she never brought that up to her mom. Like, right. Like this is not a problem where like, he's not okay in the bedroom. Like this is a situation where like, yeah, my entire life is being controlled by a person who is inflexible and cannot see that he is going to destroy us all. Yeah. Literally and figuratively. Yep. Um, there's the, the part early it's in the 1980s section when they're talking about the, uh, the move-in process, where uh, there's this huge list of stuff to do to prepare for the housewarming party, and it's just assumed to be her work to mm-hmm. do. Yeah, she's very vocal about how later on that she is obviously – she hasn't said anything at the time, Yeah, but this is obviously something that has stuck with her for so long because later on when she's – spoilers, I guess – leaving him – Yeah. Um, she points back to this as being like, we weren't even like in the house properly. Like we weren't getting our stuff together. I was doing all of this and he was trying to pretend like everything was great and and like rain money down on people and have like this great thing. Like everything was fine. I'm the one who was in the kitchen doing the dishes at midnight while he was sleeping like a baby. Mm-hmm. It's like, y'all, I feel that. Yeah, this uh, this kind of hit close to home for me because again, I mentioned earlier, um, I have you know I lived in South Korea for a long time, and I'm not saying these are like direct 100 uh, percent parallels between Korean and Taiwanese culture, but my mother in law deals with this with the uh, the expectation that this kind of stuff is her work, and uh, you know friends that I know that are more my age kind of you know, dread family holidays, because if they're married, some of this stuff is their job because they are the, the, you know, the wife of, uh, you know, this family's son. So that means they get to do all the cooking for six hours to prepare for the holiday and stuff like that. And even if you're not in that situation yourself, yeah, uh, going to another person's family who might have more traditional gender roles, Mm -hmm. now are you suddenly kidnapped into the cooking and cleaning brigade while all of the husbands get yeah. to sit around and like have fun and, and, and watch games. Like it's a very interesting, like, again, we're talking about Taiwan in devotion yeah. and it's a very culturally, uh, it's mixed up in the culture, but like 
there's nothing here that's unrelatable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there are things sure. that you will see in your own life from this game. You're like, okay, yeah. Yeah. You don't need to have personal experience in Taiwan or East Asia or uh, anything else. You'll just, you'll just see this um, around. And it's telling that both of us remember this detail to the same degree as like the chase scene. You yeah. Know? So yeah. like they are treating both of these topics with the same gravity. Oh, you know what? That's a a good point. I I wanted to bring this up and I forgot when I would. Now's the time. Uh I Let's love how they tease this early on cuz there's the the Li Fang uh, like ghost monster that chases you. Yeah. I love that it didn't turn out to be uh my wife is evil. And that's like the cause of the problem in here is that my right. wife is evil. It's just the way he views her because of how she has tried to take her life back. And like she eventually goes and she does go back to work and then she does leave him. And I think that she leaves him. If I'm getting the timeline right, she leaves him and then he makes this drastic action with Mei Shin when she's gone. I think so. But this is just the way that he views her as this monster, not right. that she is the antagonist in the story. Which also, again, points to how this game is so good because there are no monsters. Yeah. It's just human psychological, this is what he has turned her into. Like You're seeing a physical manifestation of his psychological demons, mm -hmm. and they look like her because... I mean, it started out the first like broken piece of his armor was getting bad notes on his scripts. Mm -hmm. By the time we get to his wife leaving him, he's like torn open psychologically. And and she was really, I think, the major death of his ego to have his wife be successful, leave him. She's she is succeeding without him. Yeah. And we talked about gossip too. And part of the reason the, the mom brings up gossip is because they are both in an industry that is geared towards gossiping. Mm -hmm. Like uh, they're both famous uh, and in kind of the entertainment industry, which kind of runs on these sorts of toddy things. So she's out there like in public being asked about these things and talking about these things, she can't really like she has to choose either to stay silent or like be really loud about what's been happening to her. Mm -hmm. And that she decides to be really loud is something that absolutely is starting to destroy his psychological um, version of himself where he is the Lord and commander of his life. Yeah. And uh, it's so good. Yeah. Like there's so many layers and they're playing with all of them. And I love that. Mm -hmm. He just can't handle that. He can't control her. He can't handle that. She's successful without him. Uh, there's, there's one part earlier when she wants to go on TV and she's going to wear this dress. That's the important dress, but it, I think it's like low cut or something. And it's like, um, it is her, it was her signature, uh, dress when she was yeah when she was famous before when she was famous um, and it's not low cut it is a sort of dress that has slits oh, which right, was right, not right. it wasn't originally meant to be like a sexy dress it just kind of took on that persona mm -hmm. after like using it culturally in different ways um, and it's like this beautiful red silk dress yeah and he's mad because her wearing a, re a revealing dress will reflect poorly on him. And so like, this is all about him. Mm -hmm. All of this is all about him. I also really like just as a, this is kind of a side note, but mm -hmm. I really love that the developers, I like seeing where things were going was like, Oh, he murders her because in domestic situations like this, that's, kind of what happens a lot of the time like your percentage of being murdered by your partner is very high if you start yeah. to get into these into these problems and i do believe that he's like hit her um at some point in the yeah, game Yeah, i do think so yeah 
So like as you get increasing levels of violence in the domestic sphere, the chances of getting murdered by your partner are very high. So the fact that actually she's out living her best life. She got out and she's famous again. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I mean, she's not going to have a good time after after the daughter situation. Right. Um, but like yeah. I'm I really appreciate they didn't take they're not they're using tropes, but they are not um sitting in them they're not like using the easy way out and being like wouldn't it be really scary if you walked in and he'd like murdered her and stabbed her to death and it's like actually i think it's actually more psychologically terrifying that he is falling apart yeah because she's doing well Mm -hmm. it's definitely more interesting that way that just the way I, I love and this is why we're spending so much time just talking about him as a person because the way that the way he is as a person and the way he reacts to what everybody else does, just like everyone else, his wife and Mei Shin are very, seem like very normal people with normal desires. And he just can't handle it because it's not exactly the way he wants them to be. But also, again, great writing. He's not the monster either. Like you're seeing a lot of his flaws and failings as a human being, but you can understand where those are coming from. He feels he has a lot of pressure to be the provider, to be perfect, to Mm -hmm. make sure that the home life is all going 100% according to plan. And culturally, he's being told that's his job. Mm -hmm. So there is something that is ingrained in him from a very early age to say like, it is my job if my wife is going out and like, doing something that like proves that I am not covering all the expenses. If she has Mm -hmm. to go out and get a job, it is my failing. Like that's where he is. And you can understand that perspective Yeah, and that he is also a loving father. Like I, I don't think there's an argument that says he doesn't love his daughter. He wants her to be well. He wants her, Mm -hmm. he wants her to be this perfect little child that, you know, wins, everything and does great yeah. grades and all of that but like he also is spending all this money and time and effort on making sure that she is well mm-hmm. and whether or not she needs it is is a question i think that is perfectly ambiguous in this game i yeah. don't think there is ever really a yes or no as to whether or not she is actually physically ill yeah so Rewind just a little bit because Rewind. you, you, uh, a phrase that you said kind of unlocked like where to talk about Mei Shin. Um, and that's things being ingrained from an early age. And this is another uh, cultural thing that I'm familiar with. Um, there is a ceremony on a child's first birthday, and I forget what it's called in the game uh, because uh, Chinese, Taiwanese words are like um, Teflon. I will not grab onto them. But uh, in Korea, it's called doljanshi. And it's the same exact same ceremony. You get a one-year-old baby, put a bunch of objects in front of them. Whatever the baby grabs signifies their career direction or the direction their life is going to go. So people are like, I hope they grab the money. That means they're going to be they're going to be rich or they're going to be motivated to make a lot of money. Or I hope they grab the microphone, then they'll be a singer and stuff like that. And so Meishin has this um, at the beginning and it kind of shows like Meishin is under pressure from uh, the age of probably from the age you're not one. even conscious. Yeah. yeah. She's too young to have aspirations. Even until the end of her life, she's still too young to have like serious aspirations. Right. You can tell that the only things that she wants out of life is to be her mom or her dad or to make her mom or her dad yeah. proud of her. Exactly. Yeah. So the way that this kind of manifests is, and I think it comes from like Feng Yu being so just, uh, what what's the word? Like so self-conscious about himself and feeling like, you know, well, I didn't make it. Now my kids got to make it. Right. Living vicariously through your child. Exactly. They push this kind of dream of stardom onto her uh, where you you see the, the, sh- the thing that she really likes to do. She likes to draw and she likes to sing and be like her mom. So they put her in these singing contests. 
Um, and there's one that plays, I think it's like three times you get increasingly more of the performance and you find out that she lost. Mm -hmm. Uh, She came in second place. Yeah, by one point. It's, it seemed like it was rigged to, you know, let the defending champion win, Mm -hmm. but she, I, so back to her sickness, I think what happened is she has anxiety Yeah. And uh, the the physical thing that's happening that makes people think she's sick is that she has like panic attacks or anxiety induced asthma or something like that that gives her trouble breathing. But it's coming from this pressure from her parents, or at least one of her parents. Right. And of course, she can't communicate that because she probably has no idea that that's even what's happening. You would have to kind of understand the social dynamic like children just don't have the life experience to be able to communicate like yeah i only get sick when i'm freaking out and i only get like this kind of sick or i i'm not actually like always it's so telling to talking about the the singing competition that it is both parents failings mm-hmm it is not just the dad putting pressure on her. The mom is also, even though we don't see this directly, but the girl is like singing the song her mom was famous for. Mm-hmm. So obviously the mom has some sort of like, I am also living vicariously because I can no longer live out my fame and fortune and be a part of this life anymore, but I can... Mm-hmm. I can still have a part of that if my daughter's doing it. So you can go back to her sickness and see it is both parents that are doing this to her. And the doctors are trying to kind of put it politely as much as possible to like yeah. suggest she's not ill. Taking that right back. Hold on. She is not sick in any uh, physiological way. Yeah. So – this is another like cultural thing that they touch on here. And uh, another example of dad being stubborn about his views about the world and things too, which are probably informed by culture around him. Um, But when it's suggested that she is not, you know, she doesn't have a a disease or something the way that he thinks uh, that she should seek psychiatric care, that's a hard stop for him. He will not entertain the idea that that's a real thing that should be explored. He's, uh, he just says, my daughter's not a lunatic is his quote. And that's the end of that. Like there's no exploration down that path whatsoever, which is an interesting, uh, you know, we have gotten better as a culture in the last decade plus about mental health and normalizing, you know, seeking treatment for these things. Um, Therapy, even when you're not, you know, going through it as a a valuable tool for for good mental health. Uh, This is the 1980s in Taiwan. Uh, So this is, I I don't want to say this is all the dad's fault. I'm sure that a lot of people would probably react this way. Yeah. If I were in my childhood, yeah. And my parents, a doctor came to my parents and said, you should seek like a, a therapist. My parents would absolutely have had the same reaction, angry. Like, how mm-hmm. dare you suggest that my daughter is a lunatic, is mm-hmm. is insane, is something like that. Whereas now, that's just sort of like, I'll drop in and be like, hey, anybody who is dealing with anything, you all should go to therapy. You know, yeah. everyone's really, that has become a much more open thing that has become accepted to the point where I'm like, I don't know if people younger than us understand how stark that difference was. Mm-hmm. But again, it's, a, a, you don't need to know Taiwanese culture to understand what that stark difference looked like. And it's not, you know, it doesn't have to be Taiwanese. I mean, it's Taiwanese because this game's in Taiwan, but it's it's just like the other things we talked about. It's not, you know, this isn't local to Taiwan. This is probably everywhere in the 1980s, you mm-hmm. know. It's, yeah. you know, not even 15 years ago or something. This is, it's almost like ancient history as far as, you know, mental health and mental care goes, you know. Yeah. And then they also talk a lot Offhanded, it's not something that comes up directly to you, but they talk a lot about what the parents are kind of doing to make their daughter 
better. Mm -hmm. Um, So I believe the mom is trying to get her to take all these different vitamins and all these different pills. And we do see that a little bit later. Uh, And the dad is turning to religion, spiritual medicine, spiritual medicine in some sort of way. I don't, and I guess it is something that like quote unquote helps. And he thinks it helps because she gets better, but it's like one of those coincidence kind of things where she, I don't know if the daughter gets less pressure or if this is after she's, no, it's not after she's lost. Maybe it's when she's getting into the competition and they're both excited and happy for her, but somehow the pressure is kind of taken off of her. Yeah. And then suddenly she's all better Mm -hmm. and they don't put it together that it was the lack of pressure or the lack of anxiety. He connects it to the fact that he took her to this mentor. Yeah. It's uh it's right after the second place finish in the singing competition when she gets much worse. So it it should be simple, you know, cause and effect. Look at this, you know, she was fine and then the singing competition and now she's sick again. What conclusions can we draw from this? But it's he's not that kind of person. He he thinks that he has all the answers. Um, and I, I think that like there there is a possibility that talking to this mentor, talking to somebody who's not her parents, may have served as a sort of like therapy in a way to help her help her out a little bit. And like maybe there was some little techniques for like, hey, if you feel your you know, if you feel your breathing getting like that, here's something that you can try. There might have been something that was genuinely helpful there. Um, But it is probably in combination with, like, lack of high-pressure situations at home. It's so interesting that this mentor is about as antag is much the antagonist as anything in this game. Yeah. Uh, because this is a person who you discover in great detail later is very good at figuring out what people's weaknesses and failings and fears and doubts are and mm-hmm. using them to her financial gain. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's cult leaders, right? Like, that's how cults work. That's how people get into stuff like that is something that will help you either find a place to belong or that appeals to like helping, like you said, finding those weaknesses that can be exploited to get people to join. And that's how she makes her money is from these people. And that's one of the things that drives uh, the money problem in the family is that she requires a lot of money Mm -hmm. and uh, Feng Yu is giving like a huge portion of the family's money to her for this continuing treatment. And and they don't ever say, he doesn't ever say, and a lot of the times, I don't think the game ever says giving money to her. They say giving money to Guanyin. Like they talk about like Mm. giving it as an offering to this like spiritual figure. Yeah. The the The, framing of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not it's not this woman, it's it's for the the spirit. Right. And and they're kind of hiding the reality from the reality. So it's like it's so much harder and so much more ingrained in him mm-hmm. you, to be able to like pull him out of that situation because now he believes that he is connected to a higher being and that helps his ego because I am special, I am beloved of a higher being, a greater purpose. Um yeah. And getting him pulled out of that situation was like, no, actually, you've been fooled. You have been tricked by someone and you're giving money to a charlatan who is like bleeding you dry mm-hmm. is a much harder conversation when someone has convinced themselves, actually, things are bad because I haven't given enough money to <laughs> whatever yeah. the powers that be. 
it's uh it's almost like the worst thing that happened to Mei Shin is that the mentor helped her out at the beginning and mm-hmm. that gave that gave Feng Yu all the confidence in the world that like this is where the results are. Like the doctors, they don't know shit. The yeah. she knows how to help. Right. And Sigu Guanyin is the uh the path to uh healing her. It is such a good example of that adage of like charlatans are always sure of themselves mm-hmm. and like knowledgeable intelligent people are very rarely sure of themselves mm-hmm. so it's so much easier to believe someone who's like 100 percent, this is what you have to do and it will work versus someone who's like we might need to seek other things this much you know so it's a great way to show this is how people fall into these traps in a a very compassionate way. This is not um, trying to make us feel like the father is stupid or like, how could you fall for this? You can really see how easy it would be to go down this path. Yeah. And you said earlier, and this is like, this is kind of the ultimate expression of that, that he very clearly loves Meishin. And the reason he's getting in with this, you know, this, this mentor, this fraudster is because this is where he thinks the results will be to heal Mei Shin. So he loves her, obviously. And there's that scene with the storybook where like, uh, a they had to cancel star. a vacation yeah. because he said it was because the weather might cause one of these events of her respiratory symptoms. But she, Mei Shin was sad that she couldn't go on a trip with her parents. So he goes in and he reads the storybook and he like indulges all of her little kid ideas about how the story should go. And it's like, you get to see for like this brief, you know, 20 minute section, him just being like a wonderful father. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you really do see like, he's not a good person, but he, he will take the time and he's expending all this energy in other directions to help his kid out. Yeah. And it is, it becomes something so heartbreaking when you realize that the daughter has been trying to get his attention and show him mm-hmm. her worth in a way yep. um, by making these little origami flowers, which in the, in the story, the flowers represent the thing that heals the father. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, she is literally obsessively making these they're like at one point you have like a whole room of them or something Mm -hmm. and you learn kind of towards the end of the game that she has to her mind made the perfect version of this origami flower and she's put it at the back of the story and the next time he reads the story he will see it he will know that she loves him he Mm -hmm. will understand her worth and then you realize he's never seen it he's never come across it until we assume after she's passed like the timing gets a little confusing as you go along because you can say one way or the other like maybe he's looking back after having had her passing and seeing this and has kind of rattled his brain and he starts to go off the deep end or maybe it was before and that's what pushes him Mm -hmm. but it's really sad to see this storybook, which was a symbol of their good relationship and how much they loved each other, um, to see it ignored, that he had not picked it up again. Yeah. Basically, like through that whole storyline, when they're talking about how Mei Shin is making these uh, origami flowers and all of that, he's just obsessively like working on scripts that are never going to get picked up. Mm-hmm. Uh, or doing stuff with the mentor. So it's it really sad just like you said she's doing everything she can as a uh, you know a little kid and he's just you know ignoring her. Another example of him being like, you know, I, I know what's going on. Nothing right. else really matters right now cuz I know how to fix this. If he could get out of his own way, everything would work out. Yeah. But because he can't, that's the ultimate downfall of of this character and all the characters around him Mm -hmm. because he, because he is going to fall and because of the position he is in, 
in in this family and in this life and in this culture, if he falls, everyone falls with him. Yeah, at least the way he sees it. Yeah. yeah. So this, like, I think the the compounding kind of like erosion of his control over the family with his wife getting ready to leave or even like leaving again, timing's really weird because it's a very if you try to like talk about what happens and where it falls in like the timeline of when Meishin dies and what is the game? Is it him exploring his mindscape and his memories? Uh, it's one of those where it's like your character is working through the inner workings of their like subconscious to discover the terrible truth about what they did that they have repressed or yeah. something like that. That's sort of the camp I'm in. The whole yeah. game starts after her death. Yeah. And he I, is yeah. working through the fact that his daughter is dead. Like yeah. it probably in my in in my headcanon, like it probably has only been long enough for it to settle into his brain that she's dead. Mm-hmm. Like it isn't for my mind, it's not been a long time since she's died. And now he's like, Oh, how did I get here? And he's going slowly losing his mind. Yeah. It's kind of show so it's really ambiguous too at the end of the game after you find out what happened to Mei Shin, you, there's a scene with him sitting on the couch in front of the TV the TV's on like all static and he's just kind of sitting there motionless but his pose is such that like he might be dead he might not be he might be asleep something like that so various avenues where he could be forced to travel through his you know his psyche and uncover what happened here. So um, let's talk about what happened to Mei Shin. So he gets more desperate that, you know, she gets really sick after this competition and obviously the mentor can help. So she walks him through this ritual uh, first, I think um, for him. So there's a ritual for him and then the ritual for her. The ritual for him is the one where you go inside like his inner, I forget what they call it, like his inner palace or something like that. And that's the one where he needs to prove his devotion to, hey, devotion, uh, to Sigu Guanyin by um, first scooping out one of his eyes, then pulling out his tongue. And the tongue scene is is real gross too. Yeah, real brutal. This (laughs) scene is set up so fantastically because by the first uh sacrifice of your eyeball you recognize everywhere you go is going to be worse and worse sacrifice of something and you (laughs) don't know what it's going to be or how it's going to and you walk up to these slow walk you're in some kind of supernatural realm at this point you are slowly walking up to pedestal by pedestal and there is some sort of implement there. And for the most part, you have no idea what you're going to do with these implements. Yeah. So like the first one with the eyeball, I was like, okay, this could be an eyeball scooper, you know? Yep. But by the tongue one, I was so taken back because I had, I was like, what on earth are we supposed to do with this hook-like mm-hmm. thing? And then he just, put it, I'm like, oh. It's real gross. And like, just just think about like the what it would mean to pull your tongue out and like, you know, physically like right. the, the tongue is not, you know, it's much bigger than you think it is. And it's like a, it would be an ordeal to pull it out. It's ridiculous. It's not that he gets to slice it. No. Like no. he literally has to rip it out. And it talks a lot about, because this is, this is his psychological um, construction. This part where he's, taking out his eye and his tongue and yes. that stuff. And yeah. even in the game, it is set up like that because it is set up as the mentor walking him through a sort of vision yeah, through the realms of the afterlife um, to retrieve. I think the idea is that the daughter's spirit's been wandering and yeah. they need to get it back. He needs to, I think, it, I th- so the way I, I understood it was like, this is step one. Before you can do the ritual where the daughter will help or where Sigu Guanyin will help Mei Xin, he first needs to prove his worth to Sigu Guanyin by doing this. So this is all of his construction, how he views the sacrifices he's made 
for his family, essentially. Mm. So we are seeing not only his taken to extreme uh, ideas of what his jobs have been, what he thinks he has accomplished for his family. Um, And if you are thinking from his perspective, if you are the sort of person who's I'm the sort of person who's ripped my eyes out and pulled my tongue out for my family Mm -hmm. to have all of this bad happening to him, to have his wife leave him is something that would be uh, unfathomable, unfathomable. Mm -hmm. I can't even say that (laughs) word right now. Um, So you see a lot from his perspective in this sort of absolutely bizarre, gory, supernatural Mm -hmm. situation. And we talked a little bit about, uh, we teased how some people did not enjoy this particular section of the game because section, yeah. they had praised how down to earth and grounded the rest of the game is. But I feel like this game is, or this part of the game is still down to earth and grounded. It's just his construction of what's happening. So it's that, not actually yeah. happening. I don't think there's any argument that there is he's actually transported to the afterlife. Right. The only thing that I think actually happened that like analogs with this is part of like ritual number two is there's a blood sacrifice uh, as part of the recipe for it. And I think that that's what these after he rips his tongue out, the third one is he stabs some like scissors through his hand and like collects blood in a bowl. And I think something like that probably did actually happen. But yeah, I, I don't think that this is too fantastical for the story because it's there's been a lot of fantastical stuff that's happened in here. Right. There's an evil version of his wife chasing him around. There's, you know, you never know what kind of fantasy thing is waiting for you whenever you open a door. Um, there's the part where you walk down the stairs and the big serpent from the folk tale is mm-hmm, like drowning mm-hmm. in the wine down there. Wine and that or folk blood. tale is so interesting too, because yeah. like the snake is a good guy. Yep. <laughs> um, and it's twisted again. Uh, repetition of theme so perfect becomes a thing of fear even though it is supposed to be a good uh, thing in Mm. in the story in the story it's good yeah i think people may have misinterpreted this because it the criticisms i saw made me think back to fatal frame which is one of my favorite of scarier games Mm -hmm. um and it starts uh, again very grounded and then like a lot of these quote unquote scary games start with like plausible what's really happening mystery sort of things. And then they just dive headlong into like spoilers for anyone who hasn't played Fatal Frame, uh, (laughs) dive headlong into like, oh, you're in hell and it's all demons. And then Mm. it's like, oh, this is this is much less scary because now it's just kind of ridiculous. Like we've gone and, and jumped the shark here. But like that's not what's happening in this game. Yeah. This is a manifestation of, of psychology. This is not he's not actually magically in this realm chasing after his daughter's spirit. Like this is him it is showing his absolute desperation in a way that you can play. That is not yeah. just a like watch this video to see all the scary things that are going on in his brain. It's literally acting out the elements that are happening to him and how he feels like he has been doing and what he's been doing, how devoted he is to being a good father, a good husband, a good man in general. That desperation, like the the desperation to figuratively scoop out your eye, rip out your tongue, and then stab yourself through the hand. So unnecessary, by the way. If you just need a little bit of blood, like, come on. Yeah, you just just do the hand thing once. The tongue can stay. The eyeball can stay, you know. (laughs) Um, But that desperation is what drives him to do this completely fucking off-the-wall ritual to that he thinks is going to save uh, Mei Shin. So the ritual, for those who are playing along is a um, a ritual that kind of echoes that folk tale about how the serpent saved the village boy and then was crowned uh, a guardian by Sigu Guanyin. And so what happens is um, 
the person who's doing it has to prepare a uh, pure wine. Uh, they need to place a spirit serpent inside. So just put a snake in the wine bottle, uh, offer some blood into a container, mix the wine in there, and then uh, the, the wording of this, place the subject in the container, uh, which short thing throughout the game in the apartments, there's a uh, a wine like fermentation jug in the kitchen. And for a second, I was like, did they put Mei Shin in that thing? Yeah. No, I was oh definitely worried that that's yeah. what was going. But it's the bathtub. So this happens. Uh, he fills the bathtub with this wine serpent blood mixture, puts Mei Shin in the bathtub, locks the door so she can't leave. And uh, the the ritual is explained as the subject will leave the container alone when fully recovered. Nobody under any circumstances shall interrupt the ritual. Um, and there's a checklist. And on the checklist, everything's checked off except that last part where the subject is going to come out. Uh, and the bathroom door has been locked the entire game, except for one part where you have to go wash your hands. Other than that, it's been and that you wash your hands, room. by the way, you get you get blood on your hands. I don't like it. It really yeah. freaks me out. Yeah, it's a, it's pretty gross. Um, so the way that uh, this is like plays out is you read the ritual and then um, there's a time when you're walking downstairs from the mentor's house into the apartment because the mentor lives upstairs. Convenient. Yeah, convenient. Uh, hey, look, the, the savior is just up the hall. Look uh -huh. at that. Um, so the first phone call is the mentor explaining how to do the ritual. The second phone call is uh, Feng Yu has called because like, it's not working. She's still moving around in there. She hasn't come out yet. It's been a while. And the, ma the mentor says, uh, you need to be patient. It might take up to seven days and you must show your devotion and don't open the door. And then the third phone call the mentor's phone has been disconnected. So she has skipped town. She realizes that uh, a kid has died on the floor below me. Um, so she's out of here. And you finally, like once this is all done, you walk in, you open the bathroom door, you feel, you hear the floor is wet and you're just left to, you know, infer what happened to Mei Shin, just this terrible death in right. here. And it's again bringing up all of the why didn't she why didn't she leave on her own she's sick one but also she's been told by her father that this is religiously culturally familiarly the thing she has to do mm -hmm. so she's not left this bathtub of her own will as well because she just wants her father's approval she just wants to be loved unconditionally by him and and prove that she's the best daughter. And she wants to feel better. Like there's yeah. parts where there she talks about how like she doesn't want to be sick. She wants to go sing and she wants to go to school and all that stuff. And she just wants to feel better too. So like if she had been given the tools to be able to figure out what was going on, to be able to stand up for herself she probably would have gotten out of that bathtub. Mm -hmm. But because she wasn't, again, failing of both of her parents, but the father especially has put her in a place where she can't defend herself and then is told she has to defend herself in order to prove that she is now cured. And that is such a sad, sad story. It's one of those, like, it could have been so easily prevented and therefore is sadder. Mm-hmm. Um, than if he had just gone in and like stabbed her to death. Yeah, that is what makes this like so interesting to me because it, it, like I I think fairly early on like people can probably jump to the conclusion that he killed her or that she died because of him, but no one would ever guess that this is the way that it happened. Mm -hmm. Like this is so uh, creative from a storytelling perspective, um, and and so much it's so much more terrible than if he had just choked her to death or something like that. Like, right. This is, and it would have been over sooner. The oh, way yeah. that this they, is a terrible way to die. The way that they pull out the story through these telephone calls mm -hmm. and you are, you, the player are slowly piecing together exactly how she is dying and exactly what's happening to her and the, the excruciating nature of what she's going through. 
of like, you know, I've been in a bathtub for like a couple hours and I'm like, oh, I already feel bad. And that's water. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) She's in water. She's cold. Like it's not being heated after a while. She's just in this cold, snaky, whiny, bloody wine bath. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the alcohol in the wine is, is going to start eating away. Like just, just the more you think about what's happening to her in there. And it's such a genius thing that they never show you. They don't show you any of the results. They don't show you what has happened. They don't give you your brain that sort of like, it's a weird way to put it, but they don't give your brain that kind of satisfaction. The closure. Yeah. Yeah. To know like, okay, that's, that's happened. Um, And it's so, it's so easy to miss all these implications and if you're not the sort of person who's going to sit there and dwell on <laughs> what was actually happening, I yeah. can assume that you're going to miss out on – like I assume there are people who played this game and just kind of don't understand exactly what happened at the end. I can see that. Like if I wasn't taking podcast notes, maybe it would have not – well, if I hadn't spoiled the story for myself right. years ago. but uh... I think part of me too, I think part of – just being human is like you don't want to think too much about it so Mm -hmm. i think there is a temptation to sort of be like okay i get the implication something bad happened and i don't want to think too much about it uh, onward but i think the game is much stronger if you do think about what was going on because it's so like what happens to mation is so terrible it's one of the worst deaths i've ever seen in a horror game i've ever heard of like yeah exactly like it's very fucked up and so the more you think about it and that's you know this is great psychological horror because the more you think about it the more you think about all the decisions that went into this situation uh the decisions by the mentor the decisions by her dad and her decision as you pointed out to just stay faithful that, hey, my dad is trying to help me and right. the mentor the has helped me before. The innocence of a child that like your dad is doing the best thing for you and the complete yeah. trust she has of her father yeah. is the thing that murders her. And that's- It's brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what did you make of the sequence after this? So like you open the door, the screen goes white and all you hear is the wet footsteps. So like, you know- you know, she's been moving around and stuff like that, but you know, you know, she's dead, but it doesn't show you that what actually happens is it goes to white and there's this like dream sequence where she talks to her dad and they go to a playground and stuff like that. What did you make of that? I think this is a continuation of what was happening with, uh, the sacrificial scenes. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe that his brain cannot cannot deal with what he has seen in this bathtub. He cannot deal with the fact that it is on him. I think it would have been, it's weird to say it like this, but like a a satisfying fairy tale ending to have it wrap up in (laughs) he, yeah, I know, right? Uh, He opens the door, he sees the horrific scene and takes, finally accounts for his failings as a human being. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think they wanted to give you that kind of satisfaction, that kind of conclusion. So the ending is as um, unsettling as the rest of the game, even though it is this very beautiful dream sequence. But it also perhaps gives you less nightmares. <laughs> yeah. So it's like it's nice and pretty and like you get to see Mei Shin and she's really happy and they're, you know, she's she's like you know, let's, let's, let's play. And then, you know, let's go home. But it's really twisting the knife because you know what happened to Nation in real life. And it's just this reminder that she was like this little angel of a kid. Right. And a reminder that he never, he didn't learn his lesson. Yeah. Like he did not. That's what his brain has put in this place of this horrific yeah. thing. It's like, he hasn't learned his lesson. He's not taken accountability. He's still the same horrific egotistical person all of the things that drew him to murdering his child are still there and continues on there's i mean there is an angle to this i think you could take where 
like this is him thinking that things are okay now. Like if he's that far gone and he's that broken that this is like he sees this and it's like she's she's okay now she, she's healed she's, the ritual is complete she yeah. actually made like yeah it, it's interesting that i think there are a lot of interpretations of this and all of them can be true at the same time mhm it's a it's a i think it's a good way to end the game and you're like definitely right that had the game ended and you saw whatever version of you know like a mannequin in a bathtub you know, stained red or something like that. Like that would be less, it would be almost less effective in a yeah. way. Than Your imagination is always more horrific than anything you see. For that specific type of thing. Yeah. And uh, just when those phone calls are playing and you're walking down that hallway and you know, like it's time to open the bathroom. I was like, I don't want to open that no, door. No, don't want to touch that. <laughs> yeah. Cause exactly like you said, your imagination you know, it's it's gonna it's gonna be much more impactful than anything they could make in the game. Whew. Devotion. Lighthearted three hour gameplay. <laughs> yeah. Uh and a uh really, really fun two hour discussion here. So um unless there's anything else about devotion that you want to talk about. You know, I'm gonna think of something in like twenty minutes and yeah, be like, everyone get goes. back together. We have to say something. But I think we've covered everything. Yeah. Well, um, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, this so like you said you played Nine Souls. I haven't played it yet. I'm waiting for when I have time to do it. But detention You're waiting is, for a time that doesn't exist. I know, I know. This is what we're gonna talk about <laughs> on the talk podcast about that. uh very soon. Detention is really, really good. It's a very different style of horror, but it's a really good game. Uh Devotion is incredibly good. And I've heard a lot of good stuff about Nine Souls, and I played the demo, uh, and I enjoyed the demo a lot. And the demo has some really uh, like graphic stuff in yeah. it too, like mm -hmm. kind of a you see that cutesy art style, and like look how colorful it is. And then someone's head gets ripped off, like yeah, like 100%. ten minutes into the game. There is actually a point in the game where things start getting a lot creepier, and you can kind of see their like horror traps as yeah. well. But that game is so good. Yeah, you should I'm go play it. Definitely going to do it. Um, but I was going to say, like, between this uh, and detention and what I know of Nine Souls, uh, Red Candles just, they're they're basically up on that list now of, like, whatever their next game is, I'm playing it right away. Yeah. You know? They, they are just really, really good. And because of how different their latest game is, mm -hmm. I am excited because it's not I, I don't know what's coming, you yeah. know, as when Devotion came out, I'm like, okay, their next game is going to be another type of horror game. But then you get Souls-like action game and you're like, what? Mm -hmm. So whatever they choose to do, I hope it's real different. And it seems like they've got really great foundation for really anything they want to try at this point. So yeah, agreed. So uh jill thank you for taking two hours to talk about devotion <laughs> thank uh, you almost for as long as it takes on. to play the game <laughs> oh what if people do it as a companion and they like play the game listen to the section that we talk about it and play the game that would be i think that would be a confusing experience but <laughs> go try it out someone tell us yeah someone someone be the guinea pig try that out uh, but i i appreciate you taking the time again i'm uh, looking forward to the next one that we can do and um, I will, uh, for everyone listening, I'll throw a link down again in the show notes to the Indie Informer and the Indie Council. So you can check out everything that Jill's doing. And, um, you know, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah. And for everybody listening, if you have made it to the end, as always, you are my heroes. Even if you've listened to the discussion about Devotion, this is a game that I think... Um, even if you've been spoiled, is definitely still worth playing because we, we cannot possibly describe in words how some of these things look and the way the way your play experience goes as you go through some of these things. So definitely still worth playing. So again, a recommendation. And as always, tune in next week for the next game to come out of the backlog. <laughs> Ta chan sai ma thou, 
遥望着北方，青丝飞上白霜，心还惦着他，心里没说的那句。Hello, my name is Aaron. I'm one half of Superpod Saga, a topical variety video game podcast fueled entirely by nostalgia and unleaded gasoline. Superpod Saga, we discuss a different video game topic each and every week. We have new episodes every single Monday covering a different video game topic. More than anything, we want to entertain our listeners and make you feel like you're one of the boys, like you're hanging out at a campfire with some of your best zany caffeine powder. Powered buddies and just talking about your favorite games and all that stuff. Stop on down to Super Pod Saga. It's on every podcatcher there is. If it's not, let me know and we'll get on it. But again, Super Pod Saga, stop on by. Hey. Oh, hey, Jeff. What's going on, guys? Oh, you know, talking about Superman. Oh, cool. I could talk about Superman. I could talk some more about Superman. We know. I'll bet a few people would want to get in on this. I'm down. You know it. That sounds like fun. I'll do it. Cool. Let's do it. We can call the show Men of Steel. And you can find it at certainpov.com. Or wherever you get your podcasts. Yay.